Kevin Bowen here. Don't forget to listen to The Fan now on 93.5 or 107.5 FM. And check out our latest coverage online at 1075thefan.com. Less than a month away from the NFL draft. We're back. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. Insert NFL offseason flies by comment here. It is pretty crazy to think that April is just a day or two away. And depending on when you're listening to it, it might already be happening. Kevin Bowen and Chris Presley here on Kevin's Corner. CP, how you doing? Oh, not too bad. Yourself? Not too bad. Um, you got a final four pick? Um, I'm going to go with Kansas. Ooh, rock chalk it. Going to go rock chalk Jayhawk. I won Villanova. Got a little financial stake. I also enjoy rooting for Villanova. Um, just think Jay Wright has done it the right way. Mm-hmm. But, um, man, those Duke freshmen showed me a lot there in that regional. Uh, but I do feel like Kansas is one of those teams I haven't seen enough of this year that it, you know, watching them the second half against Miami, holy hell. Uh, they look like it could be, hell, they look like it could beat the Pacers. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, hopefully some good games Saturday night and then Monday night as well to cap things. Um, wrapping up NFL owners meetings this week. Mm-hmm. That'll be our main topic here on Kevin's Corner. And thank you to, um, yeah, I've been fortunate to go to the owners meetings in the past and you're kind of at, there's like two or three of us there, you know, Colt beat colleagues and then, you know, everybody back home kind of gets all your information and, and, and reacts to it. So, again, thank you to Stephen Holder, Joel Erickson, Zach Kiefer, J.J. Stankovitz down there, you know, picking up a lot of the sound and video. Um, so we'll recap some of those comments from Jim Ursay and Chris Bowden and Frank Reich. Also, um, for those that missed it, we had Jacob Tammy on our morning show, Kevin and Query, earlier this week. You know, I was thinking when the Matt Ryan trade happened, I was myself, Chris, all right, former Falcon that would provide some insight. Is there a former Colt slash former Falcon? Tammy popped into my head, Mike Chappell. Being the dean that he is, was able to provide me some contact info. And we had Tammy on the morning show, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, my plans weren't necessarily to put it on the podcast, but I thought it was too good of an interview not to. So uh, for those that missed it, we'll play that uh, later on on the pod as well. Again, Tammy, a, what, third, fourth-round pick, I think, back in the yep. kind of late Manning years. And then, you know, followed Peyton out to Denver. And then joined uh, up with Matt Ryan. He had a he talks about a Peyton prank in there, per usual. <laughs> and I just thought some really insightful comments on Matt Ryan. So we'll play that as well. Um, should we get into? Yeah, let's get into league it. meeting stuff. Yeah, what what are some of your uh, takeaways from the league meetings? Well, should we start with the big guy? Start with the big guy. Uh, Jim Irsay spoke. Um, and I tweeted out Tuesday night, Chris. I really hope that in my lifetime. Um, a boss does not talk about me the way that Jim Mersey talks about Carson Wentz. Um, respect the candor. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you want people to give their opinion. It is just a bit crazy to me that you see an NFL owner go to this extreme with Carson Wentz. In a way, it's like the, he goes to this extreme about Carson Wentz, but yet the decision makers that made the trade for Carson Wentz don't seem to be at fault really at all in Chris Bauer and Frank Reich, which is really interesting to me. Three of the quotes, and again, this is from Steven and Joel and Zach, so I'm just kind of reading through their work and uh, breaking it down for you. These three quotes all stand out to me. Ursay, it was just something that we had to move away from as a franchise. It was very obvious. Quote two, and I think this is after talking to some veterans you know, around the locker room. Oh, my God, there's something wrong here, and it needs to be corrected. It sounds like me, like seeing like a funnel cloud, like entering the picture and being like, "All right, <laughs> pack up the picnic. It's time to go. Come in." Just f- full clarity. Yeah. I've never been at a picnic when a tornado hits, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Uh, and then the last quote: "Sometimes you feel like you have to move on because you can't persuade people to do things different if they don't want to do them differently." Sounds like a high school girl sitting down at the dinner table with her mom explaining a breakup. <laughs> I mean, damn, dude. I mean, it's, it's uh, he's not messing around, Jim Irsay, with those comments there. I, you know, part of me thinks that Wentz disdain has just reached a level that I'm like, was it really, really this bad? Again, I think if Irsay removed himself from this, 
you would have had a bit of a tussle between Chris Bowden and Frank Reich on what to do here. Right. I really think this is Ursa significantly driving things. You know, he mentioned how he talked to the locker room. I don't have the timetable, you know, in front of me by any means, Chris, but, like, remember, they lose to Jacksonville. Four o'clock. And by eight o'clock that night in Indy, Frank Wright and Chris Bowden were in his office talking to him. Mike Chappell, I think that very next day, explained a bit of what that meeting centered around, you know, demanding change. And, you know, Chappell had a lot of stuff off the record from that meeting. At that point, had Ursay, you know, talked to all these veterans in the locker room, you know, were those most more exit? It seemed like Ursay just kind of had his mind made up at that point. And again, I think Carson Wentz was not the answer. You guys have heard me say that. But it seems like it's reached a point where it's just like, Nope, he was in charge for the sinking ship and no one else. I, I don't know. Maybe I feel bad for the guy on his way out, but it's like, did anyone see the offensive line in week 18 against Jacksonville? Right. One of the worst offensive line performances I've seen in the Frank Reich era. Anyone watch the defense on that opening drive? Wentz was bad, but let's not act like he was the sole reason here. So, um, boy, again, if you're a Commanders fan, you read that, and it's another reminder of how in the world did the Colts get what they got for Wentz. <laughs> Kudos to Chris Ballard for pulling all that heist. And, you know, Ursay said it to those guys down in the owners' meetings, and I've said it all along, that they, they would have cut him. They would have flat out cut him. To get any return when you know you're right. about to cut a player is is remarkable. And like you said, he didn't, hold, he didn't bite his tongue at all. So... Mm-hmm. What what was going on behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great question, Chris. I wish I had more clarity on it. Um, that last quote, sometimes you feel like you have to move on because you can't persuade people to do things different if they don't want to do them differently. Right. You know, my co-host in the morning, Jake Query, thinks that's all vaccine-related. I think it can be rooted in that, in that initial interaction. You think about you meeting a person for the first time. If that person rubs you the wrong way or if you have an issue with them initially— it takes some time to get back on good graces with you. Mm-hmm. I think that was the case with Ursa and Wentz. I also think there were some times where he was a bit too stubborn to coach, to coaching, and his playing style really didn't change at all. You can make the argument his playing style got crazier as the year went on. Um, so I think that is some of it as well with where that quote comes from. The all chips in comment, you know, Ursay clarified and said, emotional and mental commitment to excellence and greatness by anyone in the circle. It's just surprising to me that we talk about a football team with so many high character guys. And again, I believe in the high character approach. I think a screw or two loose is needed in the locker room. Definitely think that. Mm-hmm. But that they didn't want to go very physical last spring. And I've talked about it from day one of that decision last year and that you saw more physicality and, you know, Clay Junior High, Cherry Tree Elementary's playground <laughs> than you did with what the Colts did last spring. It got physical on Cherry Tree's playground. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to – I mean, I, you know, you're pushing kids off swing sets and, oh, yeah, you're <laughs> on the monkey bars and you can't do a back football. Blah, blah. It was glorified flag football, two-hand touch at 80%. That's what the Colts, and again, the Colts players and their staff collaborated on this, and they decided you come in for two weeks, we'll ramp back to physicality big time, but you'll be here for two weeks in person. While you saw other teams around the league do a lot more physically than the Colts chose to do. And my issue at the time was you've lost six straight season openers, you got the hardest schedule in the league to start the season. Why? Why do you continue to do the same things in the offseason? Yeah. Um, so I think that is a bit of where the all chips in clarity comes from for Ursay. But again, you, you expect your high character guys to, to be all bought in with that. So um, that was kind of interesting to me. Any thoughts on who we met by the uh, two first round picks they thought about giving up for a quarterback? Young quarterback, I think it was what he used. No. I, I, every every move that it, I've I've gotten to the point where every move that the Colts make, I just I can't 
not necessarily figure out, but I I can't project. So, <laughs> well, I and to be fair, I don't think they could project Matt Ryan. No, you know, I mean, they no. they pretty much said as much there. Um, I thought Kyler Murray was who he was referencing. I know some people thought Watson. I I thought more Kyler. I don't know, maybe Derek Carr, but Derek Carr. Maybe he's young in Ursay's eyes, but I don't know if he qualifies as you know truly young. I think Kyler makes sense. I don't think with the allegations you would want to touch Deshaun Watson, nor would this franchise. Yeah, and we'll see. I mean, they they gave a call. I guess we'll we'll, we'll never see. But you know, if that would have gotten to the point of actually, I don't think it would have. If it would have ever got to a point of, you know, trade package and whatnot, there. Um, Any other takeaways you got from that? Was mainly Ursay. Um, and again, if anything stood out to you, feel free to chime in. Kind of moving over to Ballard and Reich. I really like the hiring of John Fox. You know, I think he, um, I've said this before, I think there's a lot on Frank's plate. Mm-hmm. A lot on your plate when you're the play caller and you're the head coach. So I think it's good to have another vote or another voice in that room. And I think it helps you out big time. You know, he has a really different philosophy than Gus Bradley. Frank made a good point down the owners' meetings, like, okay, if that hire can put a seed of doubt into an opposing offense preparing for you that week, hey, guys, have we looked into the John Fox history? You know, do we have any games against Fox in our career? Extra hour prep. Something like, you know, what can you do to try and improve your chess match in the preparation? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I like that. Um, you know, is it an overwhelming move? No, but um, I'm all for – Differing opinions, different voices, um, and then collaboration with that to make sure you do get on the same page. But just, you know, guys say, all right, this is what we've done against tight ends in the past. This is how we've handled bootlegs in the past. This is what we do in the fourth quarter to adjust throughout a game. Um, Albert Breer on his story that the fourth round, a fourth round pick for Matt Ryan was the initial offer from the Colts. Are you surprised at all that Matt Ryan didn't have like more suitors? Not only more suitors, but or to answer your question, yes. But then also the value, right? And I'm not saying uh, obviously a guy and in... I mean look what Carson Wentz went for. Yeah. You know, I'm like, so you're going to turn around and flip half of that for a quarterback that's arguably or not arguably that I think is much better. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree with that. I get the age, you know, right. that's certainly factors into it but much more durable <laughs> i mean throughout his career uh, and even and, even like i texted you just listen to the original um press conference just the the demeanor the way he carries himself you can understand i mean hell if it doesn't work out if he can fill potholes in indianapolis he could be the mayor <laughs> i mean it's just the that professionalism and the way that he carries himself you can understand why he's going to control the locker room and wait till you hear what jacob tammy has to say right i mean don't take our word for it. Just listen to Tammy here coming up in a bit. Um, that will add to it as well. Um, Ballard had a quote there. It said, I wanted to make sure Matt knew that there's no doubt it's going to be two years. I think that was in reference to the restructuring mm-hmm. of his guarantees. A lot of it is on that second year. Um, I hear that quote, but at the same time, I want to make sure that quarterback is still on the table in, in the draft next month. Um, unlikely? Uh, sure. Does it make the most sense to win now in 2022? No. But if the right quarterback is there, you still should not be afraid to take that um, for many reasons. Ballard had a quote that said, uh, the opportunity to, and this is in reference to like life after Andrew Luck, the opportunity to acquire a quarterback, young quarterback, hasn't presented itself for us. Now, I see that quote, and part of me wants to say, well, yeah, no one shows up at your door and says, hey, Chris, here you go, Patrick Mahomes. Here you go, Josh Allen. Here you go, you know, Justin Herbert, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. What Like, this isn't Christmas morning when you're five years old and Santa comes right to you via your, you know, I won't say any more because I don't know if we have young children listening <laughs> to the pod. You know what I'm getting at. Right. You've got to go get the present. Right here in the AFC, whether it was Watson, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, these teams went and got the present. So the opportunity to acquire a young quarterback hasn't presented itself. 
you've got to present the opportunity yourself. You've got to go and get that opportunity. I don't necessarily agree with that that line of thinking of like, that comes to you. No, no, no. You make up your mind in the draft process, just like Chris Bowd was a part of it in Kansas City, about Mahomes. He was in on those early scouting trips to Texas Tech on Mahomes. And then when Ballard left, they did kind of the, the, the meat of that work. But then Brett Veach and John Dorsey and you know Ryan Poles and all those you know decision makers, Andy Reid certainly, sat down and said, all right, it's our time now to move up from 29, 27, wherever they were, and go ahead and trade Mah- trade for that pick. And obviously they watched the board fall as it did in that 20, uh, whatever it was, 2018 draft, 2017 draft, something along those lines. Um, sounds like Naeem Hines in the slot. I like that. Yep. I like getting Naeem Hines involved a little bit more. I guess the last one before we get to Twitter que- or before we get to Jacob Tammy, then we'll get to Twitter questions. The wide receiver thing. You guys have heard me talk a lot about it. Um, I would say the issue that I have in hearing their comments about wide receiver not as pressing of a need as I have said on this podcast comes more from their rationale than anything, Chris. Let's look at the depth chart right now behind Michael Pittman. As I've said all along in the offseason, you operate like you don't have Paris Campbell on your football team. Mm-hmm. Luxury item at this point. 15 games in three years. When he's played those 15 games, there's been a flash or two, but it's not like Paris Campbell's look like, you know, Jamar Chase in his 15 games either. Like, there still are some questions about him in the NFL. Again, flashes. Right. But again, it's not been a thousand yard Paris Campbell. So there's one. Other three that I would think the Colts would mention most early on their depth chart right now. Ashton Doolin, undrafted free agent, never caught more than two balls in 43 career games. Desmond Patman, six round pick, two years into the league, two total catches. Mike Strawn, seventh round pick. Rookie season, two catches. Kiki Kuti, if you want to go there, one right, catch right. last year, cut by the Texans. It's not like you have what you had at defensive line last year when you looked at that position group and you said, let's see what we have in the young talent. Think about D-line last year, Chris. Tyquan Lewis, Kaboko Terry, Ben Banigou, all those second-round picks. Then you draft Quiddy Pay, draft Dio Dengbo. Okay, I could kind of see the line of thinking. I don't agree with it. I thought you needed another veteran last offseason, but I get it. You have these first and second round guys. You want to see what they can do. Chris, you don't have that in the wide receiver room. You don't? No. These are day three picks that you're th- – it's fine to have, well, maybe one of those guys can blossom into a fourth stringer. or a th- Fine. But the fact that you're banking on them right now to be two, three, four – wherever you want to label them on your depth chart. And I am probably a little bit higher than Michael Pittman on mo- than most. I think Michael Pittman could be a one. Some of my colleagues, I feel like a little, little bit hesitant to go there. But let's say you do have a little bit of a question about Pittman. Wouldn't you want to bolster behind him even more? What, wouldn't you want to support Matt Ryan at 37 years old when his best years have clearly been when he's had elite, high-level talent around him at wide receiver? Right. That's where I run into an issue. The second part of that would be this. Ballard himself has stated, you cannot expect rookie wideouts to come in and make instant impact. And I get it, especially when you're drafting at 42. Sure, you've got Jamar Chase and you've got Justin Jefferson and whatever, but, you know, we saw Michael Pittman not come in and make an immediate impact. So, again, the fact that Ballard says that but then doesn't act on it a little bit more, I'm just... Literally scratching my head. I don't know if it's because I haven't showered yet today or if it's just because I don't understand it. Um, the two moves that make that just don't add up to me is just what you saw what Cleveland did with Amari Cooper, what you saw what Tennessee did with Robert Woods, to run heavy teams in the middle of the pack of the AFC. Um, hell, I, I say middle of the pack. It's unfair to label Tennessee as middle of the pack when they're just the number one overall seed. But the fact that those teams look at and say, we need to do more. They did that with day three picks, not gargantuan first, second rounders, and yet the Colts did not do that. Yeah. 
Got to give Matty Ice some more opportunities. Right? Got to give him some more, uh, and, and, and tight end's one of those positions as well. Tight end as well. And I'll say one more thing before we move into, I, I don't, I'm sorry to end if that was your transition to Jacob Tammy. That was a great transition if that's where you were going. <laughs> um, you know, I see some pe- people mentioning, you know, remember how Bill Polian viewed for agency. Remember how Bill Polian viewed wide out. Two things. How much has the NFL game evolved in the last 20 years? Right. Number two. Polian six years into his tenure, Ballard six years into his tenure. At this point in the Polian tenure, Hall of Fame quarterback, two Hall of Fame wideouts drafted in the first round, not necessarily by Polian, Marvin wasn't. Um, two Hall of Fame caliber defensive ends, not to mention a future defensive player of the year at safety, a left tackle in Tariq Glenn you never had to worry about. Right. You don't have that with this current group. You've got some studs in Leonard and Nelson and Taylor, yes, but at those impactful positions we've talked about. So, of course, Polian's philosophy is going to be different. You had already supported Peyton really, really well. Um, So I I can't go with that comparison at all there. You think we're going to look back someday and not to take anything away from what he does on the field and off the field, that pick for DeForest Buckner, you think we'll look back and say – what could have been from a quarterback standpoint? Yeah, you know, and again, hindsight is so twenty twenty, and I don't want to act like by any means we are sitting here in March of twenty twenty, I believe, and saying, "Oh, that thirteenth pick needs to go to Justin Herbert." Now, I, I know some people like that could easily have been Tua. Well, let me look up the Dolphins' seasons <laughs> lately. The Dolphins, the last two years, they've won nine and ten games with Tua. That's not horrible. Right. Don't you think the Colts have a better roster than than, than Miami? Mm-hmm. So if two is your QB here, I, I don't think two is necessarily the unquestioned answer, but here you probably would have won double-digit games with him as your quarterback, given the fact that you'd have more support than he does in Miami. So um, what I'm getting at is I feel like, and Ursa mentioned this, that the luck retirement put the Colts in a horrific situation. Indeed it did, two weeks before the start of the season. But I also think the Colts decided to go Band-Aid, Band-Aid, and now another Band-Aid. You didn't have to do that. You would have to do something drastic not to go Band-Aid, but they chose to do that. Just like the opportunity didn't present itself for a young quarterback. Well, no, no, no. You can buy. You're going to pay a lot, but if that's the route you want to go, you can go that route. Um, So that's where I would kind of push back on that. Um, All right, should we get to Tammy? Yeah, let's jump into it. Okay, this is Jacob Tammy on Kevin and Query. Jake Query is my co-host. If you don't know, um, you'll hear his voice as well. This was him on our morning show talking about Matt Ryan, Peyton Manning, his Colts days, among other things. Joining us now on the Payless Liquors Hotline, he is the tight end that started with the Indianapolis Colts back in 2008, and after a stint of catching footballs from Peyton Manning, he then decided to do the same in the Mile High City, going to the Denver Broncos before then catching footballs from Matt Ryan – and then playing for Gene Simmons, which I think personally is the coolest part of it with the L.A. Kiss. But, Kevin, you dipped into your Rolodex to bring us Jacob Tammy. Yeah, Jacob Tammy is with us now here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. And first off, Jacob, thank you for the time. Hey, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, what were your thoughts when you saw the Matt Ryan? I don't know how well you know Frank Reich. I think you guys maybe briefly crossed paths early, early in Frank Reich's coaching tenure. But what were your thoughts when you saw Matt Ryan coming to Indy? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you, I was really excited. And I do know Frank pretty well, actually. We were together in Indy, and then when he was with the Chargers, I ran into him all the time when we were in Denver, and we'd always chat before the games. And Frank and I were both, uh, not to go too deep into that world, but we were both believers and, uh, you know, did Bible studies, uh, you know, together. And we're both really good friends with the chaplain in Indianapolis, you know. So I got to know Frank a little bit and kind of the type of guy Frank was uh, throughout, you know, when the Colts hired him, I thought this is – unbelievable it's fantastic you know it's it kind of crazy story in his own right but then yeah with Matt when uh when I started hearing the rumors I thought man this would be you know you never know how something's going to work out let me just preface it you know with that but I think there's the potential for this to be an incredible fit and I guess what makes you so intrigued about this fit here in Indy well you know I know a little bit about how Frank operates and how he thinks I know uh you know, a little bit about how Matt operates and how he thinks and getting to be around Peyton for, 
the time that I did and, and, you know, being the luckiest guy in the world to get to go to Denver with him and, and, you know, have four years in Indy and three in Denver. And, you know, I left, I left Peyton for his last season because I got offered an opportunity to go play with Matt, you know, like, and be a, be a starting tight end in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, probably wouldn't have left Denver to go, you know, a ton of places, but to go play with Matt Ryan and uh, awesome coach and Dan Quinn, like it was, it was a great situation for me. Now, the thing I loved about Matt, in Atlanta was it was like a seamless transition I mean obviously you know I'm not saying Matt and Peyton are the same player but I am saying it's the same quarterback feel like the guy's a leader he's doing everything the right way like you you go in the locker room and you know you don't ever have to question if the quarterback is going to be ready to play or is going to be doing everything he can to have the entire organization on point and that's what you got with Peyton that's what you got with Matt too this is perhaps a redundancy of that answer, Jacob, but to, to kind of parlay off of it, you know, Matt Ryan has been very, uh, you know, vociferous about the fact that Peyton Manning was a mentor to him and that he reached out to Peyton or Peyton reached out to him early in Matt Ryan's career and that he really sought the counsel and advice of Peyton Manning. Was there anything aside from the approach? Was there any little thing that Matt Ryan did, a little wrinkle where you saw it in the locker room and went, that's it right there. That's the Peyton effect. You know, I think I love to have a good anecdotal story for you. I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think just the way that they operate uh, during the during the off times, you know, in the locker room, uh, going down the hallways with guys, on the, you know, on the way out to practice. You know, Matt was all about – just like Peyton, I mean, really, in in this way, like just the little things, the little conversations in between, you know, uh, meetings and and going to the field where maybe there was one tweak that, like, that final little detail of something that might help you uh, come Sunday, just to have a thirty second conversation about it uh, with Julio, with what with me, with one of the running backs, whatever. Um, you know, there there's so you could tell. I think it's evident. I guess my answer would be it's evident that those guys have had conversations over the years and that, that Matt, you know, tried to soak up as much as he could. And, uh, you know, but I think Matt was that type of player himself in his own right as well, you know, from Boston college on, like we came out the same year. I remember, um, you know, the, our draft year that, uh, you know, Matt, Matt had some of those qualities built in already. I think any time he spent talking to Peyton, just, you know, just encouraged them and, and took them to another level. He's Jacob Tammy, former Colts tight end and, again, teammate of Matt Ryan's, and he's with us here on Kevin and Query. Jacob, earlier we played some audio from Frank Reich talking about the success Matt Ryan has had in fourth quarters throughout his career. Um, from your recall in those moments looking at him in the huddle, he strikes me as a guy that those 10 guys in the huddle looking at their quarterback would have some confidence in in those moments. And I think that's something the Colts lack, and this is me talking, lacked last year. They, they, they really struggled in one-score games and in the fourth quarter as well. What did you feel, particularly in late games, with him in the huddle? Oh, yeah, no doubt about it, man. I mean, again, not to continue to draw the comparison, but I guess that's the whole point. That's what we're doing here. But, I mean, you get in the huddle with either one of those guys. That Matt, Matt was the same way. You know, as Peyton in that respect, like when you get in the huddle at the end of the game and it look, I mean, it sounds cliche or whatever. And, you know, I'm, I guess, belaboring the point, but it's it's the preparation that is what makes that happen. It's not like you just show up on Sunday and like, all right, everybody's confident in the huddle. We're down seven with a minute and three seconds left. You know, I mean, it just it's really not how it works. It all week long. You build that all off season long. You build that. And those guys both understand that. And they're really great at it. Like you're building up. You know, there's a random Thursday afternoon where you stayed after for an extra 30 minutes working a specific route with two or three receivers that are going to be in that huddle when it comes crunch time in the AFC, NFC championship game. I mean, that sort of stuff's what those guys are great about. And, and you know, Matt, Matt just – he's his record speaks for itself as it relates to all of the Matty Ice situations. Um, but just awesome dude to, to play ball with at the end of the game. Jacob, I want to touch on something because I think it's an important point that you brought up in a good way, and, and I don't want this to come off as me bringing a negative to it, okay? But Frank Reich, you know, we know of Frank Reich's belief, right, as a Christian. I mean, that's very well documented, and I commend the fact that he wears that on his sleeve. So, too, apparently, does, does Carson Wentz, and I can appreciate and respect that. 
but do you think that there's any possibility that Frank Reich allowed that bond of belief that he shared with Carson Wentz to cloud his judgment of Carson Wentz as a football player? Uh, that's a question that I'm not qualified to answer. I, I don't know enough about Carson Wentz's tenure there and his performance to really be able to answer that well. So I wouldn't know on that one. When it comes to the leadership of a quarterback, how much of it is not necessarily observing how your quarterback is inside the locker room, but rather having a quarterback that players would want to spend time with or feel bonded with outside the locker room and away from football and therefore feeling a brotherhood that goes beyond just the lines? Do you want to play harder for a guy when you feel you have a connection beyond just football with him? Yeah, um, golly, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, I I was fortunate again, like luckiest guy in the world, you know, to develop a great friendship with Peyton, and and we did a lot of stuff off the field, whether that was golf in the off season or, you know, what have you. And, and I think all that stuff matters. Uh, the same with Matt down there, and didn't have as much time, but uh, a couple seasons and and got to do some of that as well. And I think. You know, but not everyone does the same things off the field either. You know, like, uh, you know, Matt and Julio probably weren't playing a lot of golf, uh, you know, in the, in the off season when they when they had time. But, you know, maybe doing other things. I think, you know, the off the field stuff matters. I really think the bond, you know, I tell people this all the time. They ask if you miss playing. And, and really, the truth is, I don't really miss playing. I really do miss being in the locker room. I mean, a lot. And that part is, I think, what's tough for guys. And, and uh, you know, that's that that part, you just can't prepare for it. Like, I've got other things I love to do. I have other interests. I, I, I have a great life, great family, great pursuits going on right now, like, as we speak. But it's still tough to be out of the locker room. Like, that is such a unique and special thing. And I think that's where the quarterback piece really comes into play. Like, the guys that know how to operate in that space, and that that's ultimately where you build trust and brotherhood and there's things you can do inside the walls that, that create camaraderie. And Dan Quinn was incredible about that in Atlanta. I, again, I can't speak to what happened after I retired, and I, I don't know exactly why that didn't pan out great, Like, but it was going great. He, it, things were – that place was awesome. Um, and so, you know, Matt, I think, I think the answer is if you can get both, that's great. But, you know, Matt, Matt will be a guy that can do it inside the walls. Uh, and, and I think it'll be – I think – the culture piece will be will be cool. Some terrific insight here from Jacob Tammy, again, former Colts tight end and teammate of Matt Ryan's in Atlanta. He's with us on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Jacob, from when you entered the NFL 2008 to the game you watch now, where do you see the biggest changes, just kind of league-wide? Uh, don't get me started on this, but, you know, uh, that you can call timeouts after a play happens from New York City now. So <laughs> that's a that's a change. Uh <laughs> I don't really, I don't want to open that box, but I, you know, there, there's always things changing with, with that part of the game. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think guys continue, you know, you look at a guy like Davis from Georgia at the combine and it's just incredible. I mean, the talent, um, you know, I don't know how much has changed in four or five years, but it just continues to progress and, the, the speed and, and, and power of, of these players across all different positions on the field um, is just cool to see. But I think I think the game's in a good place. You know, the things you know you want to nitpick would be, for me, some of the replay stuff, um, some of the New York City affecting game stuff, uh, and, and some of the, uh, the overtime rules, which are being – pretty you know they're working through that right now that's always something that's kind of gets nitpicked and i think probably fairly um last thing that came to mind the the protection of the quarterback stuff i mean on the one hand we all get it the quarterbacks are the product but man some of these late hit calls continue to baffle the mind occasionally so those would be my little gripes what is your best jacob tammy because you played with him in two different franchises and i'm sure You've only been asked this a thousand times a week on golf courses. Give me your best Peyton Manning story. Oh, I don't know. Golly, there's there's a lot, but you know, I, I since you said golf courses, one of one that comes to mind in that situation was a golf story. Uh, 
we were on a little trip one time, uh, playing a place down in Tennessee, probably like eight of us from the Colts. And it was my rookie year, I think. And it was in the off season, kind of a special thing Peyton put together. We were, we were throwing routes and doing workouts at some random high school. And then we were, uh, you know, playing, playing golf for a few days. And we got out on the golf course again, I'm a rookie, you know, kind of a no nothing, obviously. And one of the things my wife would always tell me about when I played golf, she would always remind me to put sunscreen on. So I thought, you know what? Uh, I, I need to do sunscreen today. We get on the course. I forgot. We're about three holes in. It's 105 degrees, super hot day. <laughs> and, and Peyton comes up. He says, Hey man, you want some sunscreen? And I'm like, Oh my gosh, this guy, Peyton Manning, man. Like he's, now I'm going to get to text my wife and tell her I put sunscreen on. I mean, what a dude, like the best quarterback in the world. And he's got sunscreen for me. So I get a big blob of something in my hand and I start spreading it all over my face and neck, uh, you know, everywhere that was exposed. And let me tell you, if Peyton Manning ever offers you sunscreen on the golf course, deny, deny. <laughs> Mayonnaise, deny. huh? No, no, worse. Oh, no. Flex, oh, flex no. All. Flex all. So, oh, uh, nice. It, it went from 105 degrees to 205 degrees <laughs> over the next hour. My face was on fire. Uh, so, yeah, apparently that's a little rookie, uh, you know, welcome to uh, the golf course crew that I did get to watch get played out on some other people over the years. So that's always fun, you know, to go from the butt of the joke to get to watch do it on other people. But uh, he was great at that stuff, though, man. Everyone, he, he, he loved a good practical joke. And, uh, you know, that's really one of the things you miss most about uh, being in the locker room all the time with Peyton particularly his sense of humor was incredible, man. We laughed. We had a lot of laughs. We had a lot of great moments playing, a lot of great fun playing, but we had a lot of great laughs too, which uh, was just a real blessing, man. It was a ton of fun. But, you know, the one thing, Jacob Tammy, that I think would be really neat and rewarding for you and is a huge credit to you, clearly by going to Denver, you know, you were a player that Peyton Manning trusted. I think every quarterback needs that safety net of a guy that when they're on the field – they have a trust there. And for that reason, if there are players that are possibly being linked to Indianapolis that played with Matt Ryan, even if statistically speaking, and I'm not saying it was the case with you, but like a Julio Jones, who I think probably is on the other side of the hill, but isn't there something to be said for a quarterback's trust and comfort in some guys, and therefore we should look into it if Matt Ryan had someone he wanted to bring here? Hey, look, I mean, I'm, I'm biased when it comes to this conversation for sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. I, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I want to think that, that I helped Peyton in Denver and, and we had some great years. I, you know, I had some, I, I think it goes without player, saying you but, did, but, but, you know, Peyton could have probably been fine without me. I mean, let's be real, you know, the com getting, I, you know, I don't know how you quantify it, but it was an awesome opportunity. And I think, I think it, yeah, I mean, yes, is the answer. If Matt, look, the best the best organizations, the teams that compete for Super Bowls, just look just look at them. Just just look at them over the over the past 20 years. They're the ones where quarterbacks have a say. And quarterbacks have a say because they've earned that right. Like if you want to be a great team in the league, you go get yourself a great quarterback. Not a good one, a great one. And there's only five or six or seven of them probably out there. And, like, that's what you have to have. Is Matt and Ryan one? Yeah, I think he's on that list. Yeah, I do. I think he's shown he can be on that list. Now, look, I mean, Matt's getting older now too, right? I mean, I don't know if it's the same thing in five years. Not everybody's Tom Brady. Um, but, like, and when you have that guy, let's say you've got a guy that's in the top ten, you know, you treat him like a guy that's in the top six, Give him an opportunity to be that guy for you, right? Like that that's that's what I've seen work. Give it, taking a quarterback that has a chance to be a great one or has proven he can be a great one. Give him an opportunity to show you that's who he is. Make him as comfortable as he can be. That's what it takes to win in this league ultimately. You can take up talk about all the other pieces, but if you don't have great quarterback play, you're not gonna do what you want to do. Jacob, what is uh life like for yourself nowadays and where do you call home? Well, man, this is uh, – life's crazy, all right? I mean, we've got – I do investment work, so uh, 
I get a chance to work with some athletes and some regular folks too, which is a lot of fun. I get a chance to stay connected to the game a little bit through that and uh, manage investments, which I, I just really love. Uh, we also have an Angus cattle farm uh, nice. that's been in my family for like 110 years. So, uh, yeah, not many people with that combination out there, but that's a, <laughs> that's just a ton of a ton of fun. And is that uh, in Kentucky? Yeah, Danville, Kentucky, right in the center of the state. Uh, investment office in Lexington. Uh, cattle farm in Danville. We, you know, traveling around for work. Some coaching, uh, you know, 11U Central Kentucky Sliders travel baseball team. Look out! We may be in Noblesville at some point later this year. So, I mean, there's a lot of big stuff happening right now. I want to see um, you and you and Sorgi's squad face off. Isn't Sorgi hey, coaching? I think I've heard Sorgi's in the game. I think he's with that really good organization up there. We don't want to see those guys, but uh, you know, we'll. <laughs> We'll find another maybe one tier down, uh, but it's a ton of fun, man. I love it. I'm, you know, helping with all the kids' stuff, and uh, it's amazing how much fun that can be. And it, we're just really blessed having, enjoying life back around the grandparents, back home in Central Kentucky, and too busy, but it's all it's all good stuff. Did you get a ton of? And I mean, Wikipedia is the one that told me you played for the LA Kiss, so take it with a grain of salt. But if you did, did you get a ton of like Kiss CDs and T-shirts? I don't know who runs my Wikipedia. Uh, it might be like, you know, a relative. I have no idea. I think my aunt. I think I have like a great aunt that's like been fooling <laughs> with that thing. And I, I don't know where what that reference is to. So so you didn't play for the bad, LA Kiss in 2017. Bad, bad. So whoever's, whoever's putting stuff on my Wikipedia is, is, uh, is having a great time with it, apparently. But no, I didn't. <laughs> that is a total buzzkill. I was super excited to get Gene Simmons stories. I know. Jake wanted Man. to lead off okay. with that. I was, I was glad that he waited until the end. On Here's that. my last question for you. <laughs> my last question is, how long did it take you to get up off the floor when Kentucky got beat by St. Peter's? Oh, my gosh, man. What a deal. I mean, here's – I'll just – you know, as a long-time Kentucky guy and, and just bleed blue since I was born, um, that was heartbreaking. I will. I will say immediately. It's like if you're going to get beat, like this looks like the team to get beat by. And the like, the coach was incredible. You know, the hallway guy was just like you could tell he was a star in his post game interview. And then to watch what they went and did. I mean, they beat right. everybody, right? I mean, they ran out of steam, obviously, just here against UNC. But uh, they played some ball. Now they played some basketball. It was disappointing because I tell you, this Kentucky basketball team this year. Uh, was a lot of fun to watch and a really good squad and 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 some real some guys you just really love to root for and follow. It was a fun team, so that that stunk. But hey, credit to St. Peter's, man! What a what a run! What a run! I was gonna say you got a little bit of a uh, empathy here um, from Purdue fans as well with them no bowing doubt. out to St. Peter's in Sweet Sixteen. Jacob, I can't thank you enough. Um, I know a bit of a shot in the dark to get you on, but really appreciate. The time and the insight, and uh, good luck with everything down there. Again, investment baking and Angus Farm, like you said. Boy, that's quite the combo, but sounds like a hell of a crazy life for you. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you're ever in Indy, we can have you on again. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Happy to jump on. All right, that right there was Jacob Tammy. And um, I enjoyed that, Chris. Tammy. Seems like a really genuine dude. Yeah. Uh, the Angus Farm and the investment banking <laughs> I thought was, was funny as well. Enjoyed the Peyton prank. Um, but I thought that was some good insight and in why he wanted to go to Atlanta and what Matt Ryan is like and how he's wired. Yeah. Always love a good Peyton Manning prank story. <laughs> and, of course, on a golf course, I know yes. uh, that's right up your alley. So, <laughs> I love it. Uh, Tammy is a guy that, again, the fact that and Jake mentioned that, the fact that Peyton wanted him in Denver. You know, that's always something that <laughs> that would mean a whole lot to me when kind of looking back on my NFL career. Um, all right, let's get to Twitter questions. All right. First one comes from Garrett. Do you believe that there's more to the Carson Wentz-Jim Ursay conflict than we or the media know? Ursay made the comments. It was something that had to, we had to move on as a franchise. It was very obvious. This leaves him quite confused in the specifics. He knows about Wentz's leadership issues. Notable players seem to be happy with him i.e. T.Y. Hilton, Jonathan Taylor, and have publicly defended Carson Wentz, but he's not a Carson Wentz guy himself and was left very confused on how this all was played out off of the field. Yeah, Gary, I, I'm a little bit confused as well. Um, I do think behind closed doors, Chris, and I said this about the Matt Ryan thing, mm -hmm. when those guys look at the number two in the huddle this year in the fourth quarter, the feeling I think will be different than how they looked at their number two last year in the fourth quarter. Um, I do think Matt Ryan brings that. I think Matt Ryan offers that. And so I'm sure some of that was shared to Jim Irsay. 
But I stand by what I said earlier. Like, you got a crazy uncle or you got a grandpa that tells you some story and you've heard it 10 times and the story's been embellished since you heard it the first time. Right. Doesn't it feel like we're there with Wentz? Like, Ursay is the uncle telling the story and it's like, all right. Are you really telling me now that he set Darius Leonard's car on fire in the parking lot? You know, like something along those lines. Like it's getting to the point now where it's just like, oh my gosh, is it? You know, the Jacksonville game, Chris. There was a lot, a lot that went wrong in that game. So, um, you know, not listening to coaching, not, but I think Frank Reich really wanted him back. I think if it was up to Frank Reich, he would have been back. Is Frank just that far off? And that gets into my. You hear Ursay's comments, you hear Reich, Reich's comments, boy, they are. Whew. Yeah. Two ends of the spectrum. And, like, when I asked Joel Erickson today because he was down there at the um, league meetings. I go, when you hear an owner talk about a poor decision that has led to Carson Wentz leaving, like you hear Jim Ursay talk about it, wouldn't he be disappointed with the people that made that decision? i.e. Chris Bowden and Frank Reich, but yet it doesn't feel like that mm-hmm. with Ursay. Um, and again, I asked Joel, and, and, and no hot seat whatsoever, and I would agree with him. I think that's how they're viewed in Ursay's eyes with that there. So, yeah, Garrett, I'm, I'm just as confused. Jump to a question from Colton on the defensive side of things. He's also confused about the Tyron Matthew. Um, he loves him, but if we sign him, what does that mean for Kari Willis? Um, coming off the bench or j- once Julian Blackman gets back healthy. Did you have a chance to listen to our morning show today? I don't know if you caught that. Um, a little bit, not not a ton. Okay, we had, um, and J.J. Stankovic from Colts.com interviewed her, say, one-on-one. So this is separate from the Erickson, okay. you know, Holder, Kiefer stuff. Um, but Ursay made a comment in there about how they've looked into the defensive free agent. You know, he's a veteran. We'll see if it meets the value. He also threw something into the uh, – we don't have a lot of cap space. I'm like, you've got the third most in the NFL. Have you been someone not shown you the books and the checks that you're signing? I did um, hear that portion, yeah. I think he's referencing the Honey Badger. Now, where would he fit? Great question. Um, don't have a great answer for you. Obviously, Blackman has the Achilles, so we'd see how that would play out. Mm-hmm. Kari Willis, I think at times, really, really helps you out. At other times, in coverage, I thought there were a few struggles. I'm all for more defensive backs. Impacting the game, versatility, those things. You know, if you play nickel, think about it right now. What would be your nickel corner group? Yeah. You know, I'm not necessarily sure. Brandon Faison, Isaiah Rogers, Kenny Moore. Like, yeah, you would think that, but you lost Rocky Sand and Xavier Rhodes, and you really have only re- replaced that duel with one corner right now. So I think in sub packages, you get more creative. And I like that. I like the chess match. I mean, look at the receivers you play and the offenses you play this season. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be a fan of it. I also think the Honey Badger brings an edge. I think he brings an edge, and I think you need it. Absolutely. We talked about that a little bit with Ngakwe. I thought Dominico Autry brought some of that to you, and you missed that last year. I think that would help as well. So, again, I don't know an obvious, like, he's a starting safety, and, you know, Blackman, you know, would lose his – you know, I don't think that would happen. I I really like Julian Blackman. Um but, hey, good problem to have if you indeed go that route. He was an all-pro just two years ago. He, he had some playmaking moments last year. I, I don't think this is – he turns 30 next month. It's not a four-year thing, but I don't think this is something to where he's over the hill. Kansas City's cap situation was weird and odd, and um, I just don't think they could necessarily make it work. Yeah, and he's a fun chess piece to have out there. That's for sure. Question from Jason. Suppose by the grace of God, Paris Campbell is healthy – most of the season and goes for 80 catches, uh, 1,100 yards receiving, and 10 touchdowns. What does a contract offer look like that coming from the Colts? Yeah, it's a good question, Jason. Um, boy, 80 catches, of 1,100 yards, and 10 touchdowns. <laughs> that would be a hell of a year. A hell of a year. Um, hell, right now, you look at the wideout depth chart and you need it. All right, Paris Campbell in his career, Chris, has played 15 games. So mm-hmm. you're assuming 15 games, that would, that would qualify as healthy. You know, for most of the season. In his career, 15 games, 34 catches, 360 yards, and two touchdowns. So you are wanting to double, potentially triple some of those numbers. 
that's a lot to ask for. Yeah. Um, the number that, and I'm looking at this right now, the number that I just haven't loved with Campbell when I've seen him out there is the yard after catch number. Rookie season, 5.3 yards after catch. With Rivers, 3.0 yards after catch. With Wentz, 1.7 yards after catch. We're talking about the fastest right. 40 time at the comp. Like, you got to get that more, you know, into his repertoire. What would a contract look like with those numbers? I Two to three years, low on the guarantees. I think he can still be a weapon. I, I know those numbers. I just rattle them off, and they don't look pretty. I, I still want to see it. Um, but, yeah, I, I can't go anything more than that. But, yeah. Jason, you talk about a great problem to have. <laughs> Wouldn't that be it? No kidding. <clears throat> All right, from Wake Spike. Hey, guys, what if Matty Ice gets us to the second round next year in the playoffs? Do the Colts build around him in 2023? And does this impact the quarterback that we take hopefully in next year's draft. Also, uh, also, does that impact the style of quarterback that we take as well? You know, I think the Colts are a little bit less mobile-centric in how they view QB than I am. You know, Ballard has said before, like, at some point, you've got to work from the confines of the pocket, which there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I'm not talking about, you know, dual threat like, you know, Michael Vick and – Madden or something, but I just think some semblance of a run run threat is yeah. important. They view this as at least a two year marriage, contractually. And again, Matt Ryan has been very very healthy. Granted, you could say the same thing about Philip Rivers. What's different about the Rivers Ryan thing, Chris? Matt Ryan doesn't have you know ten year old twelve year old boys knocking on high school football door. You know, River or Ryan's two kids were what four? Yeah, I think twin boys four. Um, you know, you're you're rocking your your Garen shirt right now. I think if Rivers would have stayed here a few more years, Gunner Gunner Rivers might have been Garen's quarterback. <laughs> I mean, in all seriousness, right? Like, yeah. Um, so basically, what I'm getting at is we don't have a I want to coach my kids in high school football situation mm-hmm. in the next couple of years like you did with Phil Rivers. Right. So, um, again, my opinion: this should not impact quarterback. It, it shouldn't. I totally hear people out and saying, nope, you need to support Ryan right here, right now. And again, that's where I get to the point where I just don't want to pigeon my whole, pigeonhole myself come draft time, where I feel like right now at receiver, you kind of done that. Yeah. Let's stay there with receiver now that you mention it, because we have a question from old Daner. Could you see Ballard trading up for a wide receiver that he absolutely loves the way that he did with Jonathan Taylor running back after the Packers and Chiefs, Chiefs trades? it seems as though more teams are going to go wide receiver early. Well, I mean, think back to the Taylor trade, Chris. You only traded up three spots. You know, that wasn't a massive trade. Um, Now, I look at the offseason right now, and I still see neat. Let's put quarterback to the side. In some order, wide receiver, tight end, left tackle, defensive back. Some order, some magnitude. Decide that how you wish. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want to give up, you know, additional picks late in rounds? Uh, wide receiver by all accounts, and this is going to be the case for the next, you know, handful longer years, there's going to be great depth every year at wideout. That's just how the games evolve, seven on seven, all that. Right. Uh, now, if you're really looking for day one impact from the rookie wideout, and I think Ballard wants some explosion, wants some playmaking at, at wideout, and I get that. Maybe you do um, move up, but I, I would say no. I would say no there. Okay. He just doesn't – I don't know. Maybe he falls in love with somebody, but I know he did it for a running back. It's kind of a devalued spot, but I'll say no. Okay. This one's from Brent. It's painfully obvious that Chris Ballard views any free agent as if their previous team doesn't want them, then why would I? Is there a wide receiver he could be planning to trade for? He bought Michael Pittman Jr.'s jersey the day that he was first picked. There we and go. his number official – what are your thoughts on someone coming in in the future there? You know, a lot of it obviously will depend on value, value with Ballard, and you guys know that. You know, Devontae Parker, I think it's been a popular name, the yep. Miami wideout. A little bigger body, different body type for um, the Dolphins. Sounds like they're going to keep them, but we'll see how that unfolds. So, you know, I think it's a possibility. Of course, when I hear this, Brent, I think back to, hello, Amari Cooper. Hello, Robert Woods. Mm-hmm. If the Colts would have made one 
or two of those moves. I, I should just say probably one. I guess either of those moves. You know, I, I probably put them a little bit higher in the AFC than I put them right now. Yeah. By the way, it's a smart jersey buy. I think a Pittman jersey is a good jersey to have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sticks, is that what they call 11 sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if that's what people do that. But. <laughs> yeah. This one comes from Patrick. He wants to know, what can we do? He's trying to figure out even the, the AFC in general. The the AFC West is nuts. The AFC North is crazy. Loaded. How And we can't even win our own division, potentially. Wasn't a fan of playing a long game and then to find your young quarterback, or should we try and find the young quarterback to develop? You know, you look at the AFC landscape, Chris. It's brutal. Um, but I think you can compete within your division. I still view Tennessee as a favorite. I think they deserve that. Mm -hmm. um, and I still view them there. But you look at, you know, in a way, Chris, I kind of look at the Colts situation a little bit like I look at Notre Dame football right now. Can you have a strong season? Try to get to the playoff. You know that LSU and Alabama or whoever you want to throw in there, Clemson, yeah, on a bit of a different level. But it's like get there first and then you worry about the playoffs. Yeah. The Colts. Worry about the AFC down the road. You know, just get there. And, yes, it's a gauntlet in January football in good ways and bad, unlike anything else. But you take care of your business because, frankly, they haven't done it. They haven't taken care of their business w within the division. You know, you haven't taken advantage of it enough in the wild card either. You know, an easy division should mean that the wild card should be easier to access because you should beat up on Jacksonville and Houston right. on an annual basis, but you haven't done that. Yeah. Three more. This one comes from Drew. So do you think Carson Wentz's experience has soured Colt's view of Frank Reich, especially because he wanted him at the table? It says a whole lot that the Colts just traded Wentz with no plans to replace him with a piece behind him. Boy, you know, maybe Colts fans, but in Jim Irsay's eyes, no way. You know, he's given them a definite another chance. And it's more I just I don't agree with Irsay's line of thinking. I like a lot of what Bowden and Reich have done. You guys have heard me say that. Um, I think there is an opportunity there for them to salvage things. But to call what they've done excellent, to say that they're viewed around the league, they're two pretty nice dudes. Frank Reich, extremely nice. Chris Bowden seems like, you know, I don't know him super, super well. Uh, but strikes me, pretty nice guy, well-respected, tremendously. But when it comes to performance on your job, it hasn't been at the level that I would qualify as excellent. So um, I, I don't think the Wentz experience is sour. At, I don't think it has soured Ursa as much as you would think it would, which is weird because, again, you hear the comments and you're right. like, holy shit, whoa, <laughs> man. But then you hear his other comments and you're like, Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Kevin, we are quickly approaching one of my favorite times of the year. Um, it'll be a little different than your Reds, unfortunately, but mm. we, as we are approaching baseball season. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. <laughs> we have a Twegman, a question from Twegman. It seems like Chris Ballard is in the same situation as Billy Bean from Moneyball. Limited assets, huge holes, huge holes in the roster, you're Brad Pitt playing Chris Ballard. Oh, boy. What are you telling your scouts, and how are you approaching the draft given your predicament? Boy, wouldn't Matty Bowen love that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you have some limited assets in, in the draft picks. Not crazy limited. The cap, you certainly weren't limited either. Uh, but I'd say it in bold font, man. Drafts are vital. Drafts mm -hmm. are vital. Um your, your cap's going to get tighter. Um, continues to be that. So I don't know if I'm telling my scouts something specifically. I just think everyone in the organization knows the importance, especially at those premium spots where you haven't either drafted enough there or well enough there at those spots as well. So, you know, I don't think it's anything too inspiring. Ed Dodd's a fiery guy. We're going to see with the next pick, I believe, begins tonight. Love so it. we'll get the first episode there on it. Um but you got to continue. It's the lifeblood of it, and especially when you're in this situation right now, the cap's going to get a little tighter. Certainly the case. Last one is going to come from Matt. If Carson Wentz completes that pass to T.Y. Hilton against Oakland and T.Y. manages to score, is Carson Wentz a Colt today? Gosh, isn't that a crazy hypothetical, you know? 
so much of it wants me to say yes, but then you hear the Ballard, or excuse me, you hear the Ursay comments, and you're like, no. But, you know, if you make the playoffs with him, given the quarterback market, given your cap situation a little bit, would you have really said no? I, I don't. Again, I, I don't think it would have changed. I think it would have changed fans' minds a decent amount, but Ursay, no. Now, again, would the Jacksonville embarrassment have been that? What would you have been playing for in Jacksonville in week you know, 18 or whatever? I don't know. I'd have to look into all right. that. But it goes back to how we started this podcast. I think in Jim Ursay's minds, this was rooted. It's a little bit vaccine, but a lot more than that. A lot more than that. Yeah. All right, that does it for Twitter questions. Cool. Thank you again to Jacob Tammy for joining us. Uh, thank you to Chris Presley. As always, we'll be back next week on the pod. Starting to look closer towards the draft. Uh, we're now about a month out from free agency, so looking more at the draft. OTA should be starting for the Colts. I should say the offseason program should be starting for the Colts soon as well. So everybody enjoy the Final Four, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Happy April, everybody. Thanks for listening to Kevin's Corner. This has been Kevin Bowen. Thank you for listening to another edition of Kevin's Corner. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher for the best Colts and Pacers coverage.